Welcome to a lesson on mechanical vibrations. So this is where we have some body of mass M, such as in my picture on here, in the lower right hand corner, attached to one end of an ordinary spring that resists compression as well as stretching. So that spring that we have attached to that mass. Um, where the other end of the spring is attached to a fixed wall, so a fixed wall over here, Assuming the body rests on a frictionless horizontal plane, so we don't have any um, uh, reduction in that friction due to the surface of it. So it can move only back and forth as the, back and forth as the spring compresses and stretches. Where X represent the distance the body is from its equilibrium position. So if the equilibrium position is at this value here, so that's this. Um, distance from the equilibrium to where the mass extends to. Where the spring is unstretched, so x is greater than zero and the spring is stretched, and x is less than zero when it is compressed. So in the picture here, our value of x would be greater than zero for this. Um, according to Hooke's law, the restorative force F sub S that the spring exerts on the mass is proportional to the distance X that the spring has stretched or compressed. So this is the same as the displacement X of the mass M from its equilibrium position, where F sub S is equal to negative K times X, where K is the constant of proportionality um, for that, which is in this case, our spring constant and F sub S and X would then have opposite signs. So assuming the uh, dash pot is attached, so that was that um, C figure in the last slide in that bottom right picture, is attached to provide an opposite force F sub R that is proportional to the velocity which is V, which is the first derivative of our position function X with respect to T of the mass. So F sub R is negative C times V, which is negative C times the first derivative of X with respect to T, where C is that damping constant of the dash bot. So if the mass is subjected to a given external force, F sub E is equal to F of T, then the total force acting on the mass is the total force F is F sub S plus F sub R plus F sub E. By Newton's law, F is equal to MA, which is going to be equal to the mass M times that second derivative of X with respect to T, that being M times X double prime. We obtain the second order linear ordinary differential equation, M times X double prime plus C times X prime plus KX is equal to F of T for the motion of this mass. But if there's no dash pot and ignoring the frictionless, the frictional forces, we could set C to be zero and call this motion undamped. If C is greater than zero, the motion is damped. Uh, for, no, for no external force, we would set F of T is equal to zero and call that motion free. Otherwise, it is forced um, to be F of T is not zero. Um, thus, the homogeneous equation m times x double prime plus c times x prime plus kx is equal to zero. It describes the free motion of a mass on a spring with dash pot, but no external forces applied. Another way to look at it is if we attach a mass to the lower end of the spring that is suspended vertically from a fixed support, then the weight w would be the mass times the gravitational constant G, um, which would stretch the spring a distance S sub zero. With F sub S is equal to negative W and X being equal to S sub zero. Um, so M times G would be equal to K times S sub zero, which means S sub zero is M times G divided by K for the static equilibrium position of the mass. So if we let Y be the displacement of the mass in motion measured downward from its static equilibrium position. So going downwards in our picture on here, um, 
Then y satisfies m times y double prime plus c times y prime plus ky is equal to f of t if damping and external forces other than gravity are indeed included. So one example involving this is the single pendulum. So this is where it consists of a mass m swinging back and forth on the end of a string um, or a massless rod of length l. The position of the mass at time t can be given by the counterclockwise angle theta is equal to some function theta of t that the, sp that the string or rod makes with the vertical line at time t. Uh, we can apply the law of the conservation of mechanical energy where the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy of a mass m remains constant. And as you can see, our um, swinging of that pendulum from back uh, forward and backward. So the distance along the circular arc from zero to where our mass is, is S is equal to L times theta. The velocity V is equal to the first derivative of S with respect to T would be L times that first derivative of theta with respect to T. The kinetic energy would be T is equal to one half times M times V squared. So a half times M times the first derivative of S with respect to T squared which makes one half times m times l squared times the first derivative of theta with respect to t squared. So if we, if we choose the point O being the lowest point as the reference point reached by this mass, its potential energy V is the product of its weight m times g and the vertical height h being l times one minus the cosine of theta above the point O. So V would be equal to M times G times L times one minus theta, uh, one minus cosine of theta, excuse me. Since the sum of T and V is a constant C, then one half times M times L squared times the first derivative of theta with respect to T squared plus M times G times L times one minus the cosine of theta would be equal to C. And we could differentiate that with respect to T, which, we could then simplify here a bit to make that second derivative of theta with respect to t plus the gravitational constant g divided by l times the sine of theta to be equal to, well, zero. So with regards to that free undamped motion, so if we only have a mass on a spring with neither damping nor external force, we have m times x double prime plus kx is equal to zero. Omega sub zero would be the square root of k over m and x double prime plus omega sub zero squared times x would be equal to zero. The general solution would be x of t is equal to a times the cosine of omega sub zero times t plus b times the sine of omega sub zero times t. And to analyze this motion described, we would choose the constants, constants c and alpha so that C would be equal to the square root of A squared plus B squared, cosine of alpha would be A over C, and sine of alpha would be B over C. So it kind of brings back those trigonometric functions, like um, what we would obtain from the triangle I have here in the upper right-hand corner. So to find theta, uh, sorry, to find alpha, we would have alpha between zero and two pi with A or B, or both may be negative. So if we take the inverse tangent of B over A, with uh, B and A being greater than zero, we'll be in the first quadrant. Um, if we have pi plus the inverse tangent of B over A with A less than zero, we're in the second or third quadrant, and two pi plus the inverse tangent of B over A. If A is greater than zero, but B is less than zero, we are in the fourth quadrant. So based on these angles, we would have a general solution. X of T is equal to C times A over C times the cosine of omega sub zero T plus B over C times the sine of omega sub zero T. That being C times the cosine of alpha times the cosine of omega sub zero T plus the sine of alpha times the sine of omega sub zero T to be C is equal to the cosine of omega sub zero T minus alpha. 
And this uses harmonic, simple harmonic motion with respect to the amplitude C, circular frequency omega sub zero, phase angle alpha. And if T is in seconds, uh, the circular motion has dimensions of radians per second. The period is the motion uh, of the motion is the time required to make one full oscillation given by T is equal to two pi over omega sub zero seconds with frequency V is equal to one over T that being equal to omega sub zero divided by two pi hertz to measure the number of complete cycles per second. So a typical harmonic, simple harmonic position uses the function X of T is equal to C times the cosine of omega sub zero times T minus alpha to be C times the cosine of omega sub zero times T minus alpha over omega sub zero. And that makes C times the cosine of omega sub zero times T minus delta with the geometric significance of the amplitude C period T time lag omega, which will be alpha divided by um, that time lag delta would be alpha divided by omega sub zero. So we could see that going on in our picture on here to show our amplitude of C to where the highest and lowest points are on this graph. Um, that time lag delta, which will show again, the lag involved with that portion as well. So that's the first portion of our lesson involving this. Uh, I'll be, be on the lookout for the uh, second part of this lesson. Thank you.